Hello, uh, I'm Ron Daly, the Strategic Partner Lead for the Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative, a co-op of 23 school districts in Eastern Kentucky, and our schools, as Senator Brandon Smith here, as I'll get ready to introduce him, are doing some things, our teachers, our students are doing some things here in Eastern Kentucky that's not going on anywhere else in the nation and for the world that matter. Uh, Senator Brandon Smith and I go way back. We've been great friends. We were neighbors. Uh, Senator Smith was elected to the House of State House of Representatives in 2001. Then in 2008, he became the senator for the 30th district and he covers six counties. I won't try to remember them all, but as we've lost population in Eastern Kentucky, are, we've lost legislators, and then the legislators we have cover a greater geographical area. So Senator Smith has that major challenge of covering a large geographical uh, territory. Uh, Senator Smith recently was uh, elected as the chairman of the Mountain Caucus, and uh, so that's going to be an exciting opportunity. He's also uh, the chairman of the very powerful Natural Resources and Energy committee and so uh, Senator Smith has done a lot of remarkable things but Senator Smith just want to welcome uh, you to our program here and tell us a little bit about your district and some of the things you're trying to accomplish. Well first thanks for having me and Ron is right we've been friends for a really really long time it's nice for anybody to, to be able to have a friendship last as long but in the capacity that you've worked in how you've kept me aware and up to, to date on these issues of what is going on with all this wonderful stuff with our schools and the technology and for that I truly appreciate. Um, the district for us is, is, is really big. It goes from the tunnel there at Middlesbrough all, all the way to uh, the edge of Johnson and McGoffin. Uh, it's a really long distance. What happens to us is it's based on population and while we have lost population, uh, this is really important. We have a lot of people at home that will not register uh, in the census because they're afraid they're going to get jury duty. That's the number one thing we hear from. Well, I don't want to do it. I'll get jury duty. I, let me clear this up. If you have a driver's license, you're in the jury pool. It has nothing to do with the census. So please don't let that uh, deter you from registering for the census because when we don't have you there, we wind up applying for grants and funding based upon the numbers in our district that have need. Well, we're underserved and underserved by a tremendous amount because I get less money from the federal government back for groups in my district because they simply don't show up on paper. So you you may think you're, you're keeping from doing jury duty, you're not, but what you are doing is by not participating, you're causing our district and our children and our educators and police officers and firemen to lose funding that we could pull down uh, to match and offset the numbers of people in need in my district. Yeah, and related, I'm glad you mentioned that, that census element because the other challenge is, uh, the other data shows that the most underreported group is youth. Yes. People under five. And now because of the breakup of families, where you, uh, because of uh, drug addiction, uh, job uh, loss, job loss, yeah. people moving away, that, you know, you may have grandparents or older siblings that are taking care of these young people. So, it's very easy for those young people not to be counted. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was driving back uh, from the Capitol heading home and I was listening to NPR and there was a story on, and the story was Appalachian and homelessness. And so I turned it up a little bit and, and to break it down, they basically say that, that our, in Appalachia and Kentucky, we have the highest rate of homeless children in America. And I paused for a minute. I pulled over and actually took a screenshot of the show and he was speaking so I could find out where's this data coming from. But it's exactly what you're talking about. They, and, and their numbers, if you are a child and your mom or dad lost their job, say it was in mining, and you've moved in with your grandparents, if you're not domiciled under your own roof, they consider that a form of homelessness. So it was, it was a very skewed number, but I will tell you, it set up a chain of uh, events within me and in my thought process about this is something we can't let go by. We have literally got to get in the weeds. We've got to drill down, find out these numbers and what we can do to change this because I want to be known for the richness of our culture and our music and our quilts and the beauty of what we got and the storytelling and the wonderful character of our veterans, not for the fact that we have the highest rate of homeless children 
and America according to the story. So we've got work to do. And we talked about the Mountain Caucus. To me, getting the Mountain Caucus back together has been a priority. But this is an issue the Mountain Caucus needs to take up and we need to be having meetings and getting to the bottom of such a big number and such a sad story that's that's being told about us and we need to fix it. Well, and, and as we know, we're, our region is in an area of, of economic distress right. with what's happened into the coal industry. But we were even hurting before when even the coal industry we thought was kind of booming. There's a lot of our counties that were left behind. Uh, we know education is a key to economic development. So talk a little bit about what your vision of public education is, K-12 as well as post-secondary? Well, I mean, obviously I'm a big supporter of it. I think you're exactly right. That is the key that helps us unlock, you know, the success of our state, the success of the individual, of being able to have mobility, social mobility, and, and to move and provide. And it's important for your self-esteem to have a job worth doing and one that helps you provide for your family. But I will tell you that I've watched over the course of my service to the state, uh, that definition for me, I think, is expanded. And I think that we're seeing now that education for me can be VOTEC and a lot of other things. And I think that when I was young, I felt like you had to have a college degree in, in a certain thing. But I will tell you, there's such a shortage for skilled talent that I have literally gone through a process of just reevaluating the thinking that I, have, I had when I was younger and what people think now, that you know, if, you're, if you can do AC work, or plumbing and heating, you are going to make as much money now as uh, you know anybody that may have a higher degree or whatever, or feel like they have maybe accomplished more because of that. That's not true anymore. That a degree is a degree, and knowledge is knowledge, and a trade skill uh, is a very important thing to have. And we have a lot of potential for that. Our community college and technical system is that key in a way that these larger colleges can't do. So we have got the, the perfect tool in the mountains to help us unlock a tremendous need for the nation. You know, people need to have the techs that we've got. If you're a diesel mechanic uh, now, and maybe the coal company you worked for is gone, you can get one of our programs we've got now and learn to work on jet and turbine aircraft engines and work all over the world. So it's, it's really neat as we're seeing crossover, we're seeing a blend of education, we're seeing an expansion of the definition of what it means to be educated and the value that that adds for your family. And so I, I am just so pleased with that and that we are, with your help, really advising kids and leading them. And outside from where we're doing the interview here is the tiny house concept. Tremendous program. It's exploded all over the place. They're beautiful. And we took this idea and added a mountain spin to it and have turned it into a wonderful program. So again, uh, I'm personally going through a, a change and, and over the years of, of how I view education and what I advise people when they start telling me what their talents are and their interests are uh, as we start looking at what we have to help them move forward. And you know, Senator Spreth Smith, we've also had, we got middle school kids and high school kids who are uh, really making money now. It's, they don't have to go on to college right. because I know in Harlan County there's one teacher, his students have made over 30, uh, 300 web pages for uh, businesses and people across the nation. Uh, and so there's all sorts of other entrepreneurial things. So, uh, and I think that entrepreneurial spirit is so important. And our teachers are mentors of this new economy. Oh, yes. So some of our t teachers are just doing a great job in that area. And, but I, I do, I think they've had an uphill battle. I mean, I think it, it used to be, um, and which is unfortunate, but if you, you know, in the seventies and eighties went to Votech, then, then I think it was assumed that, well, they, they didn't like school or school wasn't for them. And, and that's just crazy talk because if you look at the amount of the math and the intelligence that it takes to do these jobs and to do to become an electrician or to become a plumber or any of these skilled crafts that we've got, heating and air conditioning, the wiring diagrams, I will tell you, much smarter than I am. So I, I'm very pleased to see that after years of, of people laboring under that, that now it's getting its due, it's getting the recognition. Matter of fact, it's it's being seen now as a live raft for us in this area that we have people that are really good at this. They just didn't pursue it, and now we're seeing older people come into the system and pick up a skill that they were already good at and to make a living that they, they probably couldn't make with a four-year degree in English literature or something. 
Yeah. Uh, you've been a very strong advocate for public education, K-12 education. Uh, talk about the value of teachers and maybe how they impacted your life and, and what is the future of teaching in, uh, in the Commonwealth? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, that I've, I've been blessed. I've had teachers uh, in my life that pushed me, that were there for me when I uh, really needed them. And, and that's we put a lot on teachers. I don't think maybe people realize how much that we do. Um, and they're tremendously valued for what we do. I, me, my voting record's been to support uh, my teachers, to listen to what they've got, to push outside the box of what we can do with education, to always keep my mind open. So like I said, my my thinking expands with the different roles. Um, uh, I think most of them, my teachers know that my office in Frankfurt is a place that a lot of them come and they'll leave their purses in there or they'll leave their jackets. They can come get water. They can come and shut the door and just rest for a few minutes. And for me, uh, I like to sneak back there when I know I've got my teachers in so I can catch up on what's going home. So I. I think it's very mutual. I have a tremendous respect for my teachers. I value them. I feel they feel that way about me. And I'm lucky to have a relationship that I've had. And, and I've had their endorsement as long as I've been in, and I treasure that. It's one of the things that's very important to me. But I think it's an exciting time. I think that there's more, I'm seeing more and more members in the Senate uh, that I feel like are more open to some of the education ideas that we've seen that maybe in the past, maybe the support wasn't there. And um, so I think we've been building uh, with some new leadership in education, working with some new senators to put together coalitions that maybe we didn't have in the past. Uh, you just spoke a few moments ago to the members of the student senate where we have uh, uh, a junior and senior from each high school in our service area of 17 counties and uh, you, you had some good interaction with them. Uh, what do you think about this new generation of young people and their potential for leadership? Well, I, th I think it's fascinating. One of the things that we did when we went in is I actually had, had done some uh, research and had pulled out some data based upon Facebook and other social media of what this new generation, what defined them. And in the group that we were just with, if you noticed, some of the issues that on a national model like patriotism and the American flag that according to social media is not supported by this group, we found out earlier this particular group has very strong ties to that, uh, and I, I was fascinated by that. And the fact that they're, they're so engaged at this early age, but beyond that, the fact that we have these programs for them. I don't remember having programs like that when I was young. I had an interest and I was thirsty, but there was no place for us to go and drink if this is what motivated you. Because of the work you've done and KVEC and many other groups out there, these kids now have a resource they have a place to go, they have events that can showcase the talent that's in this room over here and challenge them and they're bringing in senators and other leaders or representative over there so the kids get a chance to see positions they may want to be in, understand the interaction and literally be heard. It's very, very exciting what's going on here. Well, you know, as a member of the General Assembly, you're just one vote. Right. And we got two political parties that had different opinions that sometimes, a lot of times there is consensus. Um, and in, in this region, we have different ideas on how to move forward. So if you were could be king and you could just make it happen, what would you have make happen to improve the quality of life of all Commonwealth, the Kentucky people uh, in, in the General Assembly? And then also, what would you do to, you know, make this region even better? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, the beauty here is amazing. And one of the first things I would do, and we always talk about the silos. The Mountain Caucus exists because there is a need for us collectively to represent ideas that separate us from others. You've got the Western Kentucky Caucus, you've got the, the Louisville has a caucus, and Central Kentucky and all these groups uh, have issues that they define them and they collectively get in this group so that they can get their ideas out there. It'd be wonderful if we didn't have to do that. I mean, here's the thing I tell people all the time. I'm from Kentucky not Eastern Kentucky, not Central Kentucky, but I find myself getting trapped into having to say, oh, I'm from Eastern Kentucky, and I don't know when that got started, but we need to see ourselves as from Kentucky. We play a tremendous role in what Kentucky does. We provide a lot of the resources, a lot of the labor, a lot of the culture and ideas come from this part of the state. The people that flooded out west came through these gaps. They filtered through these mountains and moved on out west to create America as we know it. 
And so I'd really like to see it to where we didn't have to have special interest groups for each area of the state in order to be heard. And I think we have, we do that by, by adjusting the way some of the boards are set up, by looking at the idea of a four-year university here, by looking at the idea that if we were able to push in a, an additional four-year university over in this area and the gap that's around hazard in this area, you can, there's just a gap for a four-year university here. It's not saying that the rest of them aren't doing a good job. They're just simply a travel point that it would make economic sense to have a university with dormitories and a campus here um, that feed into the others like what we've done for the University Center of the Mountains so they're not threatened or students aren't taken from them. And we also need to push our, our medical community to the next level. If you've ever had to go out to Mayo Clinic, and I've had to go there with my daughter before in the past, when you fly out of those cornfields, that's, that city has created that region of this nation. And I see the same thing here. When you fly into these beautiful mountains, this could be the next Mayo Clinic or the next Mecca for medicine in the nation. I mean, we know we have heart disease and a lot of other areas, but to create a facility of large scale in this region where it was that medicine was number one and to have it thrive with the college system, I think it would forever reshape the mountains of Eastern Kentucky. And I think that's one of the ways we need to look at going. We don't need to, to be competing with other cities and, and other counties that have the same thing. We need to start thinking of what can we do that somebody else doesn't have, or what can we do that would fill a gap, that would bring other industry in here, other Fortune 500 companies in here, that all tie onto one another. So there's a chain of success instead of what we've seen you know, in the coal fields of the the boom and bust, boom and bust. So I think though, with education and medicine, that is the chain of success that leads Kentucky into a future that we've never had before. Um, and that, those great points. We know the young people that you just spoke to, a lot of them are going to work in jobs that uh, don't exist right now, but will exist. Our life is changing. Our technology is changing our life. And some of them are going to create their own jobs. What can we do to help encourage and foster entrepreneurism? Well, the, the number they give us is they say there's 65,000 jobs in America right now that are walking around looking for employees. I mean, there are jobs that exist that are needed, but there's not people to fill them. They, they don't have the, the training in the field yet. And you're exactly right. Some of these kids, um, are, are inventing work as they go that we didn't even know we needed before. The software industry is another one. The think tanks of what we can have, and we've ha we've dabbled in that with some success. We had an event where we were going to do coding here, and all of us got excited about the idea of doing coding. And you just never know who's going to be good at that. But I think that kind of I think a lot of people were misled in what happened, and I think that kind of gave that a black eye. But I think what we're doing now with it is leading us in the right direction. So I, I think that coding could be a way for us to show a lot of the stuff that may get maybe gets overlooked here in East Kentucky and the value we can add to it. And I think that's a really good start. And through our community college system, which I cannot stress enough, has the ability of making those classes available in a very short period of time. They can adapt so quickly that if we had a concept today with the drones, which shows you another thing we're leading the country in with our drone board, that they can offer a drone license. They talked about it a year or so ago. It's available now. We can react so quickly because of the structure of what we have here that I don't feel like other colleges can catch up to us with that. And, 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 and that brings me to the point you mentioned, the community college, and think about the universities. In that room, you asked uh, those 50 young people, how many of you already taken college classes? It's, it's amazing how many, uh, almost 80 percent or more of those juniors and seniors have been taking college classes. You know, in Kentucky, we did the we did a bill years ago when I was in the house. It was called, you know, sort of a nickname, the Doogie Hauser bill, and people may not even remember Doogie Hauser. It was a sitcom where you had this young kid, possibly in high school, but he was running a hospital. He was a you know a genius. And so we changed some of the laws to allow these kids to be able to, if they're hungry and they have the ability of moving quicker, to let them move on through the system so they don't get bored. There's no education the second kick of a mule. There's no 
value added for making a kid who's already shown that they can do upper level classes by just making them sit there. Matter of fact, I think it dulls them down and they could lose interest. And so Kentucky has streamlined our ability for kids to be able to move up through the system and challenge and take on and graduate. And you see it in this classroom, we're getting kids that are coming out, they're able to finish their college work and half the time we did, and they're out into fields that are being invented as we're sitting here talking right now. Yep. You know, and it's hard <clears throat> to believe in just three months, we're going to have new constitutional officers. You could possibly have a new governor. Then in four months, we're going to have the 2020 General Assembly. Yes. And that's it's so hard to believe. So as you look forward, what do you see uh, are going to be the major issues that the General Assembly is tackling, you know, as a whole? And then maybe you as your chairman of your Natural Resource Committee. Yeah, I think um, that the answers that I'll probably give you are going to be more regional driven because yep. we've got an issue with what happened to the miners uh, in Harlan County, and that issue is going to be taken up almost immediately. Now, while <clears throat> that may not be a burning issue to some maybe Louisville's delegation, it will be very important to those of us near Eastern Kentucky and the families that were affected, um, and obviously the Mountain Caucus. There, there's going to be issues that we're going to be talking about in the Mountain Caucus uh, with the drug issues that we've got going on and infrastructure projects that we're finally getting into line that you're seeing materialize right now with the road work that we're getting done. And we're still battling for sewer projects and water projects that are in the rear view mirror for a lot of the communities that we compete with. So a lot of things we ask for sometimes are not bright and shiny, but they're basic quality of life investment, infrastructure investments that we have to have in order to bring in the Amazons, to bring in the technology that actually has the jobs for the kids that we're currently training. So I think our view is gonna be driven from a, probably a very different angle than what maybe Central Kentucky or, or Louisville would have. And as we know, a lot of our coal severance tax monies in recent years has been put into infrastructure, water and sewer. Yes. What do you see as the future of the coal severance tax program and how that might it change? Well, the, the topic uh, currently is, is the governor saying that he wants to return 100% of the coal severance money. And, and my guess is when we go back into session, uh, I think regardless of whoever's governor, that's going to be a discussion. And so if the governor does put that and then for most people listening, that's just a starting point. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, but because then once the governor makes a suggested budget, then it's going to wash through the chambers. I think the support is in the Senate to return the coal service money at 100%, because when you look at the formula, um, and it's a washing process of where you pour money in, and it goes through this washing process, and then it comes off the top, off the bottom, off the middle, and it doesn't make any sense to anybody that looks at it. Matter of fact, it's so complicated by design that few mountain legislators truly understand how it works. My thoughts always been that was by design years ago because it was a way for other areas of the state to siphon off that money, but make it look like Eastern Kentucky was still getting its share. And that's why I have filed many bills uh, while I've been down there to get rid of the formula, change the formula, to break down the silos, to let a dollar, if a dollar goes in, a dollar comes out. Uh, you shouldn't send you know, a dollar in and get 12 cents back out of it because that happened to us for a while. And so it's been a constant battle to do away with this formula. But what happens is to make it work in Frankfurt, you, you give coal service money in the past to some people that are in what they call coal impact counties. But if you get enough votes to it, those coal impact counties, they don't want to lose their money either, whether they put in, in, in there or not. <clears throat> so when we make this decision, it will be a tough vote because you're going to be taking it away from, say, 45 counties and giving it back to 10 or 15 that actually produce the coal. And how are you going to get the votes to make it happen? So that's what happens. They, they passed this in the past many, many years ago by giving people that actually didn't put money in, some of the money out of it, and those people are gonna to vote to fight to keep that money. So how do we get them to do the right thing by putting it back in with the counties that actually are dealing with the trucks, they're dealing with the dust, they're dealing with the coal mine boom and bust, and putting it back in that box and making it right and, and getting the numbers to make that pass. And that'll be the true strength of the Mountain Caucus's first challenge, is if we are gonna get the coal service money back, uh, then that, that will be the battle of numbers for us. 
Well, and it's, of course, it, there's a lot of controversy over this. Remember, there's some of the coal service tax went to the Rupp Arena. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 that, and of course, now, before, now that the coal, the amount of coal reserves are down, the amount of coal production is down, there's not near a big of money. And so taking all that money back to the, the counties, the coal producers and coal impact counties, won't impact the general fund as much as it would have uh, a few years ago. No, it won't, but I'm, I'm ever mindful of um, that when money gets earmarked in this particular case to go back to where it is, that it sometimes gives people a pass by saying, well, they're already getting that, so we don't need to take any additional general fund money and put over there because we'll just see how this works out. And so we have to make sure that if this is done, and I suspect it will be, that in the long run, we don't wind up trading horses and winding out with a donkey in the sense of that we do get our money back, but overall we lose money in the budget because we depend on both. And we have put a lot of money in the general fund. And so we wanna make sure that if the coal service money comes back, that they don't wind up taking it out of a pot somewhere else that also goes in to help this region. And I mean, we saw before years ago, and I know it gets confusing for people, but they did read to achieve around the state of Kentucky. And it was great, it was supposed to help young people, you know, get a leg up on reading. Well, when it came to Eastern Kentucky, and people will remember my, my just outrage on the floor, they wanted us to pay for it. So we got ready to achieve like everybody else, except for with a caveat, we had to use our own coal so severance money to pay for a program that everybody else got for free. And, and the point was, most people didn't catch that. They're like, well, you're getting it. And I was like, yes. But we're having to pay for it, whereas Louisville and Lexington and Western Kentucky and these places are getting it covered by the general fund. How is that fair? Mm -hmm. And so it's frustrating being a mountain legislator. I mean, when you get into the weeds and look at some of these wrongs that I feel like have been dealt us over the years, um, it's hard to swallow. And that's one that uh, was very difficult for me. I was a very vocal critic over this particular maneuver that was tried to be pulled. And... Uh, that we have to stand ever ready. We can't let, we can't trade in Frankfurt and come out with less than what we started out with. That's happened to us before, and I will not let that happen on my watch. Um, a lot of people don't understand what goes into becoming a state legislator. Uh, uh, you are part-time, everybody, you, you can't exist on the salary as a part-time legislator. So what are some of the other things that people don't quite understand uh, that you'd like them to understand about you as a state senator or when you're a st House member? Uh, well, the, there's a big difference in the House and the Senate, and um, the House is much uh, more um, contentious maybe. It's a lot of activity over there, good or bad. Uh, and it was always described, if you look at old political writings, that the House is like a hot cup of coffee and the Senate's like the saucer, that if it spills out, it can cool down. And so while I dealt with a lot of information in the House, uh, I didn't get a chance to do deep dives and stuff like I do in the Senate. The Senate kills a lot of bills. I mean, just simply, we the, a lot of bills are filed, uh, I think, for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes somebody will file a bill just because uh, they told a constituent what they would. They don't care if it's a good bill or a bad bill. They sent over to the Senate. And then we have to go through those and kill them. We actually have to do the accounting. We've got to make sure it matches that the money's there, fiscal notes. And I enjoy that. I like slowing it down, having had the benefit of being on both sides and reading it and, and finding out there's some wonderful things we've done in there, absolutely incredible things. And there's some other stuff in there that if you don't watch the details in it, uh, you can cast a vote thinking you're doing something good and really wind up benefiting a few people at the expense of the whole. So I, I like the speed uh, uh, of the Senate, the slower pace, the more chance to take a look at it. I do miss the the, the debate, it's louder over in the house and there used to be a lot of colorful characters over there that would really go at the gamesmanships of it. Um, but those two chambers have to, in the end, come together. And I think that's what most people in our district have to see is that I, I'm one vote uh, and on a good day I can go because of friendships and respect and, and, and supporting other people's issues can round up more votes than that but it's not going to be a majority unless I use other people to come in uh, and work with us. And you and I talked this morning, it's the horseshoe. You've got Eastern Kentucky and Western Kentucky have a lot of coal miners and we stick together. And then you've got the horseshoe that goes above of the farm 
lands and a lot of the farmers vote with us. So as when I was whip, I could put a successful coalition together with the farmers and the coal miners that I was able to offset maybe something that Louisville or Lexington would want. And uh, that's been our strength is, is putting together legislation that invites in enough groups that you can actually pass it. Um, and the big thing is sometimes uh, I have to support a bill for another area that uh, is probably not my favorite thing. I wouldn't have filed the bill, but in doing so by helping them uh, get a bill passed, they in return will help us with something we feel is very important. I mean, we, we, for example, we waded into the yellow taxi bill years ago uh, when the city of Lexington got into that and they needed some support from some of us in Eastern Kentucky to try to break that monopoly. And we saw it as an opportunity to get their support on a particular bill we needed here. And so there's some gamesmanship. You know, old we, fashioned we, log and, rolling. And, and, and you have to have that. Yeah. I mean, I, the most important thing for, for my constituents to realize is that without that, uh, then there's not enough votes for us to pass stuff that I get calls about or projects that we need to be put in. So you, you have, there's a give and take and nobody's king. You always have to work and, together. And speaking of that earlier, you talked about good bills getting killed, good legislation. Yes. You were, you were unfortunately a part of that in the sense that you listened to some young people in Johnson County that were very concerned about yes. vaping and jewels. So <clears throat> talk about that process of learning that issue from these young people and how you try to help them. Well, yeah, and, and we're, again, to communicate and make sure this program actually gives people tools to plug in. Uh, a lot of the legislation that I get and other members get are from you at home, and you all call us, we come and sit down with your church or your civic group, you make us aware, the volunteer fire department may have an issue. <clears throat> I look into that and find out there actually is exposure, there does need to be a fix, and that's where legislation comes from. In this case, uh, I had this group of just fantastic young people that were looking at jewels and giving me feedback on an issue that honestly I was unaware of. I think most people, when jewels first came out or the, the smokeless tobacco vapor, they thought that this is better than smoke and you know, at least my kids are doing that. And we actually had parents buying their kids this because they thought that it's just vapor, it's just mist, water, and that's better than the nicotine and the smoke that's gonna damage their lungs. And there was really an unknown about it. Well, these kids knew better. And they were they had seen symptoms among other members. They had friends that played sports that were telling them that it was making their heart race. And so it was really interesting to sit down with this young group. They'd done their homework. This wasn't their first time uh, to be in front of a legislator. And so they gave us a really good idea. We filed their bill. We worked very, very hard. Uh, we got them out of the Senate without any problem, um, got over to the House and, and ran into problems. And I for the life of me, I couldn't understand why anybody would have an issue with this. But we had the tobacco industry, um, or at least the, the electric tobacco use industry, called all their workers and told them Senator Smith was trying to cost them their jobs. So I got all this hate mail of saying, why are you against us? Why do you care about this? It's none of your business, stick to coal. Uh, but it is my business and it's everybody's business when it affects our children. And most of us adults at that time are operating under the premise that this is a better alternative to smoking. And so I invited the kids to come down. I called the committee and said, uh, look, these kids are gonna come down and they're gonna have a protest on the Capitol steps and the media is gonna be out there and you can explain to them why you guys don't wanna hear their bill. And um, I think the chairman of that committee went to leadership and pushed for it. And we found out very shortly that the kids were gonna to get to come the very next day. And, I, and, and to their credit, they were able to get parents together and the teachers and they got in their cars and they showed up very early the next morning and they met my office and they were so nervous. Ron. These, these kids had really had worked so hard, but in the end, they were kids and they pulled it together and they did a quick run through my office and we went down the committee. And for those of you that saw it, they knocked it out of the park. Yeah. They, they talked about an issue now that the president's talking about. Uh, they're talking about it all over this country. It's on the news. You just recently saw kids that had damaged their lung. They had burns on their lung. And it's a very hot topic that these kids talked about a year ago. Yeah, and it's a cutting edge thing. Now there's all sorts of publicity oh, about yeah. it. But here in Eastern Kentucky, some young people 
started a movement. They did, and they didn't get their bill passed. I mean, and, and that's the frustrating thing. They did create <clears throat> enough publicity. And I will tell you, I did get a little aggravated about how this bill got treated because my kids came down and gave this tremendous testimony. Some of the most powerful testimony I've seen. Um, they had a motion on the bill and they voted for it and everybody on the committee voted yes in support of it. So at that point, as you know, and for people at home, we could have put it on consent, which meant that it did not have to go to a floor vote. It just simply went on the orders of the day and when they gaveled out, that would become law after they voted on the consent calendar. So we were finished, it was done. Then one member changed her vote and she said she changed it because she wanted to have, for the kids to have some debate on the floor and talk about the issue. Well, I surprised myself because I, I, you're not supposed to do this, but I walked up during the committee to her and said, hey, don't do this. If you do this, you'll kill the bill. And she said, oh, no, no, people like this bill. And I keep thinking about that moment because when she changed her vote to pass, it killed the bill. Because at that point, it created a lot of lift, but it didn't lift this bill. It actually lifted another bill that was sitting in committee and they got out to the floor and passed. And a lot of members thought that's the bill they were voting for, the kids bill. And even in the news story, it used our kids testimony as though it was part of this bill. And that wasn't the case. It was disingenuous to the kids because that wasn't the bill they wanted to have. It wasn't even the bill they were testifying on, but it passed and became law. And so they were very frustrated. They were but very they crushed. hadn't given up. No, we're getting, we actually are, we're coming right back at it. Uh, I'm, I was with them about two weeks ago and uh, the governor came in, they did a signing of this particular bill. They gave the kids credit for getting it through. We're refiling their bill early on so there can be no other bills attached to it and, and their bill will finally get heard. But they did. I mean, that shows you the value of our kids and how they fit into the legislative process. It's a great story. <laughs> yeah, well, Senator Smith, thank you so much for this time. And uh, again, I know you're very open. Your your uh, uh, people can call you. Uh, they and of course you they can get on the Kentucky General Assembly web page, and you can see the emails and uh, and phone numbers to call the offices to leave messages yeah. for you. So, thank you again. All right, thank you. Appreciate it.